Welcome to Where the F is My Village, a new podcast hosted by me, Stephanie Ferris, and Shelly Academy. If you're raising a tricky kid and you know who you are, your home life is likely a dumpster fire. And when it feels like it's only your home that is a dumpster fire, who can you even talk to about it? If you've been looking for your people, you have found them. Welcome to our village where we hope you can feel supported and also laugh at the craziness that comes with raising a tricky kid. Hello. Here we are. How are you? Well, you know, I would say I'm not all here, so we'll see. I started to say, hey, Stephanie, how's that COVID going? Have have you had had the part where you're feeling better and you're like, it's over, and then it hits you again, and you're like, oh my gosh, I feel like I might die again. Well, you know what's funny is I guess I have felt so terrible that this morning when I woke up and it was like 11... I, before I moved or opened my eyes or anything, I was like, oh my God, I feel so much better. And then I sat up and I was like, oh no, I still feel like shit. It's just better. (laughs) It's just better than yesterday. Like I seriously was like, I must be all better. And then I got up and I was like, I mean, I literally was like, whoa. I mean, like I needed to sit down, but I was like, boop, pop it up. Part of the problem is, so I get, I haven't, these have gotten way better, but you know, I, I've mentioned that I get migraines and mm. a lot of times they start in my neck from sleeping weird. Um, okay. And the Botox that I've gotten for years for migraines has helped immensely. But long story short, my neurologist moved practices. It's taken like insurance a bit to catch up. So I'm like mm. a month out of my like Botox cycle. Oh. <clears throat> And I'm sure that plus um, I have barely left my bed for four days. Mm-hmm. It's probably yeah. jacked up my neck. So at like mm-hmm. seven, I took uh, one of my migraine medications that can make me loopy. So it may, like, it's hard to wow. say. It's hard to say which piece wow. of this is Okay, what. so so you have COVID <laughs> brain and you mm-hmm. took loopy migraine. I did. So, so this should be a great session. Listeners. Then. This should be an awesome session. Get mm-hmm. excited. How are you? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I don't have COVID. So okay. there's that. Well, congratulations um, on that. I have to tell you, I had, I mean, it's, I can't prove it because no one knew what COVID was at this time. But in February, 2020, I had what had to have been COVID because I felt so terrible that I called my then former husband and said, please come get my son out of my house because whatever this is, I don't want him to get it. And right. so in 12 years of parenting, I had never asked anyone to come get any of my children. And so I had it, the, the, you know, all the stuff, it was bad for about five days. Then I started feeling better and I'm like, Oh, so much relief. And then it hit me again. And I had five more days of terrible stuff. Um, and I, the whole time I'm like, what is wrong with me? Cause we you know, you know, nobody yeah. had figured it out by then. Nobody knew what it was yet. That ha- hadn't no. hit the news yet. Really? Here. No, no, it had not. I, you know, I feel like I am on the bleeding edge, Stephanie often. And, uh, so you're an early <laughs> adopter. That's what we call that. You're an early, early adopter. adopter. Way to get out there. You're embracing the I trends. Was, I was a COVID early adopter. I was on the bleeding edge of COVID. And I've had it two more times after then. So I'm sure it's done terrible damage to my body. Also, let's just take a time out to say COVID has been a terrible disease that has called, has killed friends of mine and and family members of mine. And so we are not laughing. uh, We're not laughing about COVID, but we are laughing a little bit about Stephanie having it for the first time. Well, you know, in 2023, I, I just, I really, I'm, I'm a month shy of like making it through like a whole three year period without mm-hmm. getting it. And it's I'm impressive. A, little, a little frustrated that one more thing I'm not perfect at, I'm not perfect at avoiding COVID apparently. <laughs> wow. There's so much to unpack there. If yes. you're a mental health professional, mm-hmm. we'd love to know what your thoughts are on what Stephanie just I, said. I, listen, 
I just don't care what the obstacle is. I am always going to be the person that thinks I can overcome the thing, except for fostering newborn twins when I had three children under five. And that will be a story for another day. (laughs) But my ass got kicked in about 12 hours in that situation. So, wow. um, Okay. No, I'm the can do girl. So so today, episode. Okay. So today we're going to talk about, I don't, I really don't like the word discipline, but we're going to talk about like, how do we have rewards and consequences Mm -hmm. and deal with these tricky children in our house so that they don't go feral, but also that we're fair. Yeah. I don't don't like that word discipline either. In fact, I, I had the opportunity to have dealings with the department of human services in the last week. Um, because why not really, why not just continue to have that be a part of my life? And, you know, they have a set of questions that they ask you and they asked how I discipline my granddaughter. And I I literally said, I'm not crazy about that word. I know you have to ask me that question, but it's pretty punitive. Mm -hmm. And I guide her. I guide her in different ways. Uh, I would say that I don't, I I, I don't discipline her. I don't know. Maybe that's uh, semantics, but darn it. They're my semantics. So there you go. I think it's kind of. a a new concept. And I think the new concept is um, punitive punishments aren't effective. (laughs) And, you know, if we want our child to learn something from their actions and the consequence of their actions doesn't really make any sense with what they have done, it's kind of like, I don't know. You left your bike out, so you lose your iPad. Like to my kid, that makes zero sense. You Mm -hmm. left your bike out, so maybe you lose your bike for a couple days or something like that. And honestly, (laughs) and honestly, if leaving your bike out is the only problem I've had all day, then I'm not going to give two shits about it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, goodness. Yeah. Like the bar, the bar with tricky kids has been lowered like almost all the way to the floor. So um, I made like a little outline of things to talk about. And one of the first things I wrote was, I have not gotten this figured figured out and I might be fucking it up. So mm-hmm. like no well, one should can be- Can that just be, that can be the tagline <laughs> for the whole podcast. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure we actually have this figured out and we might be fucking it up. That's- Yeah. And I feel like people, you know, I mean, listen, I'm I'm one of those people that's always like, I'm just one Instagram view away from really figuring this out. Right. So I'm following (laughs) all of these, you know, the neurodivergent, this person and the executive functioning, that person on Instagram and TikTok and everything to the point where it's exhausting. And sometimes I'm like, ah, this isn't the mind numbing thing I want it to be. I'm just constantly getting educated when I open these apps. But Mm. I feel like people speak with a lot of certainty when there really is mostly uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to embrace the uncertainty as parents of tricky kids because, well, I think just as parents, because I, because yes, keep talking. Well, and I just, you know, I don't know when I was a kid, I kind of thought my parents had a lot of stuff to back up the reason why they did anything. I don't think that was the case now that I'm a parent. But I mean, I literally am constantly trying to figure out, okay, like even something as simple as like an allowance is the allowance. You get an allowance every Friday because you're part of living in our household and we want you to learn to be good at money. Or is the allowance tied to doing your chores or the chores part of being a helpful member of our family? Like, what is my philosophy here? Because I don't really know. I'm just trying to figure it out as I go. The thing I do like, not to make this all about allowance, the thing I do like about my kids having an allowance is anytime they want something stupid, I can say, well, you have your own money. And I say it like 5 million times a week. Like, hey, can I have whatever? I want a new drone. 
I want a new basketball. And I'm like, well, you have your own money. And it saves me from saying no a lot. Because you know what? If they have 50 bucks somewhere (laughs) and the drone isn't worth their $50, we just all move on down the road. So that's kind Mm -hmm. of the allowance situation at our house. But I wouldn't say I'm nailing it. So I would say this episode isn't here to necessarily like give anyone the keys to unlocking like making everything better at their house. I think it's more about you and I discussing what things we've tried, Mm -hmm. that it's a constant evolving thing and that we don't have all the answers and really don't expect, no one should be expected to have all the answers, but we definitely are all really trying. I hope so. Yeah. Well, and let me say I used to be more punitive than I am now. I did. There are some things I did that I'm just frankly ashamed of some stuff like some things that I thought would help build empathy with my kids in reality, shamed my kids. That's a, that's one that I'm especially embarrassed of. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's a learning process. I, I think that, I think also that some traditional, I mean, let's call them traditional discipline doesn't work with tricky kids. And there are some things, there are some things I was told to do by therapists that I now laugh about. Right. Sure. Um, my favorite is the, the sticker. The, oh, uh, the sticker the, board. rewards charts. No, they do not work oh, for tricky kids at all. It's no, a nightmare. We, please tell us your sticker board nightmares, because this is, this is something, this is one of those like litmus tests that I can tell if someone is my people, if I'm like, um, tell me what you think about sticker boards. <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, they don't work. I'm like, you're my people. We had this like cute little chart for our oldest who also has ADHD, but very different than my middle. And we came home one day from our babysitter spent like, oh, this is a summer day, spending the day with her. And he had torn it to pieces. Like he had torn to pieces the chart that he was supposed to be earning stickers on. So then it became, okay, so tonight we're going to tape the chart back together and then we're going to write the babysitter an apology. Like, this is how we're going to. But so here's the thing. Most kids, forgetting kids with ADHD, but especially kids with ADHD, they don't have a sense of the future. Like the future is not really a real thing to them. They only have right now. Kids with ADHD is significantly worse. Like they don't even have mm-hmm. the ability to predict the outcome of their actions. Like something right. five, it could be five minutes or three hours from now. They can't really tell the difference. Was it two days ago or two years ago? They can't tell the difference. So if you're sitting there and going, hey, Friday, if you mm-hmm. get a sticker every day until Friday, you might as well say when you're 53 I will take you to get ice cream it is I'm gonna that... get you some hot cocoa yes when you're 100 <laughs> like it just it's too far away so mm-hmm. for my kids we've learned immediate recognition of great behavior and immediate mm-hmm. acknowledgement of mistakes which okay so here's the thing so from the book I'm gonna mention this book the explosive child I'm sure a lot of our listeners have read this book. One of the things the author talks about is basically the inherent desire in kids to do good and be good, but they may not have the skills yet to do the thing we're asking them to do. And that is completely true with my children, like all of the time. And that can be true for kids that don't have any kind of diagnosis, right? Because they're three or maybe they're seven, but they still haven't figured out out the thing. So Mm -hmm. when applying any kind of consequence or reward, I think it's really important as parents to think for a second and go, does my kid have this skill? And does my, have I taken the time to work with my kid on this skill? Because what is very easy for me on, I don't know, rinsing my plate off and putting it in the dishwasher correctly. And it's like, I've done this 5 million times. I'm a robot about it. But even to a 10 year old, like instead of getting onto them going, Hey buddy, I want to show you something. 
This is mm-hmm. what you do. You turn the water on. Don't turn it on too high because it's going to splash your plate and you're going to soak the kitchen. And you're going to rinse it off and the food goes down the drain here and you're going to put this here and you're going to close it. And you might need to do that with them five million times. Because if your kid walks their plate into the kitchen, I think we've got to win. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you can tell as a parent if you are observing them not caring and just tossing something someplace versus them just sucking at the thing. And so it's so yeah. hard to be patient about it though. Well, and also, okay, these are the things I've learned. Let me tell myself, tell on myself for just a minute because the, your dish story reminded me of something. Uh, my son consistently leaves his dishes sitting on the counter. He's 17, he's turning 18. And I would, I got steamed about it and chose not to say anything because I picked my battles. Right. And then finally he and I were both in the kitchen one day and he put his, his bowl on the counter. And I said, I'm not going to say his name, although you could easily Google it. I said, son's name, would you please, please put your dishes in the dishwasher? And he looked at me and very calmly said, mom, I don't know how to do that. (laughs) Oh, God bless him. I know. And I felt so terrible. And I said, okay, I'm I'm sorry. What? I, he said, I I don't know how to, I don't know where they go. Okay. So who's at fault there? That would be me. That Mm -hmm. would be me because I just assumed that along the way he figured out how to put his dishes into the dishwasher. Right. He didn't. I never showed him and he is, he's got some kind of quirky stuff sometimes. Although frankly, I know adults who are just as quirky about like where to put stuff in the dishwasher. And and so he, uh, he had, he had tried putting them in and I rearranged them. Oh, so he was doing it wrong. And my kids, yeah. let me tell you what, mm-hmm. they would rather not do something at all. Exactly. Than do it wrong. They don't want to do exactly. it wrong. Exactly. So, this is yet another example of do not be Shelly. So <laughs> I first apologized to him and said, Betty, I, man, I suck. I'm sorry. I'm so glad you told me. Let's figure it out. And I said, you know, you can do it this way if you want. I usually do it this way. You got to watch sort of like you were talking about. You got to watch this. Here's how this silverware goes in, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you know what? He puts his dishes in the dishwasher now. Had I well, screamed and yelled, I don't think we would have gotten to that point. And he would have been so confused too. I mean, and, and sad yeah. and ashamed. Yeah. Recently, um, I kind of took all three of my kids and opened the dishwasher and showed them how it operates. <laughs> like, okay, look, that's hilarious. on the bottom, this thing spins and it's going to spray water everywhere. And then on the top, this sprays water everywhere. So if the plate or bowl is facing you know, this direction, is it going to get clean? Like, because they don't know. This is magic box. <laughs> Watch this. I mean, I, I sort of don't know, to be honest. Well, I mean, listen, <laughs> I haven't taken a class on dishwashers. I just like ha- can see the bars and the, you know, whatever. But I mean, just to say like, hey guys, when you put this in, and I've done the same thing with like the washing machine or, oh my God, a shower curtain. Mm -hmm. Like we've gone on vacations before and the two boys upstairs, their shower has a glass door on it. And I can't even tell you how hot I was when we were at the Hampton Inn in uh, Tupelo, Mississippi. And my kids basically like soaked the bathroom. And I realized they had no idea how to use a shower curtain and that that curtain needed to be in the bathtub in order to avoid flood. I mean, it wasn't flooded. It was just ridiculously comically wet. And I was like, oh my God, like, oh, what, what happened here? And then they're looking at me and I'm like, the sho-, you know, I'm like the shower curtain. And they're like, we closed the shower curtain. And I'm like, oh my God. Okay. Let me explain to you how a shower curtain works because the sh- the curtain, this part of the curtain needs to be in the bathtub or else mm-hmm. the water is going to hit it and drain all over the floor. But they just, they hadn't had a lot of experience with a shower curtain. So no. Okay. And I, I think that staying calm is the best advice I could give anyone. And it's so hard. My husband and I had this conversation recently. It is so hard. And let me also say this, and I have to say this over and over again with adults when they contact me about my kids and their behavior. 
I pick my battles so hard because the number one thing for me with my kids is my relationship with my kids. Yes, and so such a good point. I, yeah, it, it is. And I learned this, I learned this while they were doing homework or being asked to do homework. I learned this, um, just any expectation that a teacher or a therapist or a neighbor or a friend's, you know, one of their friend's parents had, um, I am not going to discipline my children unless there is a really big return on the other side, because I always risk damaging our, our relationship. I, if I, if I don't do it correctly and I am human, unfortunately, uh, if I don't do it correctly, I can damage our relationship. And so I want to make sure that there is definitely a reason to do that. And as I've gotten older, so I have a seven, my 17 year old son is still at home. And then I have my granddaughter. I parent my granddaughter so differently. Like, I can't tell you how often I say this. Hey, thanks for telling me that. Is it possible that that wasn't an accident and that instead maybe you were curious what the marker might look like on the wall? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to be mad. I just right. really value your honesty and, and, and I get a, okay, Mimi, I really just wanted to know what the pink marker looked like on the wall. And I'm like, okay, got it. Yeah. Or just here's why like, we don't do that. Here's the marker. I mean, literally I wrote down on here that something that we do is, um, we try to remove opportunities for our children mm -hmm. to get in trouble. So yeah. if you have kids with a lack of impulse control, and they're going to get into your pantry before anybody's out of bed and eat all of the cookies, then mm -hmm. you should lock your pantry. Because mm -hmm. let's not start the morning with your kid getting in trouble for with eating screaming. all of the cookies. Yes. So yeah. we, mm -hmm. we potentially look like crazy people. And I will tell you why. Because we have touchpad key locks on with like a code on the pantry, on the toy closet, on the exercise room because of, oh my God, they would kill themselves somehow in there with the treadmill and everything else on the oldest child's room, because God bless him. He has hyper-focus because of ADHD. And if he's doing something, the other two can army crawl in and steal anything from him. <laughs> so and he just doesn't even notice. So he's got a lock on there. We have a keypad lock to get into the backyard. So you can't drown in our pool, mm -hmm. no one can let the dog out but my husband and our 13 year old because I don't want anyone to die. And there's a lock on the fence too that unfortunately I feel like someone has figured out because <laughs> there is evidence. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I'm trying to eliminate opportunities because you know what? If, the, if everything's open and available at all times, what would happen is that certain children in my house were in trouble constantly for taking every single thing out of the closet and throwing it all over the floor, for eating the, the cookies that I bought for, um, your typing is louder than you think it is. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was making notes. Can you hear it? Yeah. Click, 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 click. I'll stop. Sorry. Okay. You got to use a piece of paper, I guess, and a pen. Um, but we haven't in a while, I would say a very long time. The pantry is always unlocked. What we used to do was unlocked all day. And then Casey and I would go to bed and we would set out all kinds of breakfast foods and like paper plates and syrup and the toaster and everything. But the rest of the pantry was off limits until we were up. So I swear to you, my children eat. We're not like locking them out of the food or anything. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you how often it would be like, I bought cookies for your class whatever Thursday. And now you have eaten them all because you got up at six and ate them or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we have at this cycle, my son was in trouble so much that if mm -hmm. we showed up and just walked into the park and there was something broken, he would say, did I do that? <gasps> oh, that's how much he oh. associated himself with breaking things and being bad. So oh, that is hard. I know Stephanie. it's horrible. I'm like, buddy, we just walked into the park. There's no way you could have broken that. Wow. There's like caution tape up on a section of the slide or whatever. So 
We have gone through, and let me tell you, before I go to bed, if I see a Sharpie just sitting on the counter, if I see a nail file just sitting on the couch, my I have like like the Terminator goggles. I'm like, da -da -da -da. okay, he could, while watching TV tomorrow, be fiddling with that nail file. And before you know it, there's a gigantic hole in my couch. So I better mm -hmm. grab that nail file. And without thinking, that Sharpie might get on whatever. So I better, and I'm not locking it up. I just stick it in a drawer. So it isn't in his field of view when he's moving through the house. And all of my kids have issues with this. I mean, my oldest, he has a cheap desk from Target. But you better believe his first initial is carved in it because while he was, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, like four inches tall. And the funny thing is, I don't think he even realized he did it because the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, uh, what's this? And he's oh, like, God. looks at me like, oh, my, oh, my gosh. Like, he's surprised by it also. Wait, who did who that? Has, who has carved my first initial into this desk? Um, so I guess my point is, is that I'm not saying there shouldn't be consequences for behavior, obviously. But when you have a kid who um, makes just, like, mistake after mistake, like, all day long, mm -hmm. you really need to do a couple things. Active ignoring. So let's actively ignore the stuff that is just not important, like... You didn't put your shoes away, okay? Like that isn't that important in the mm -hmm. scheme of the whole day of things. Another option is if we're really working on keeping our utility room, like our laundry room is like the tiniest laundry room in the universe for a household with three boys in it. It's so stupid small. We moved in here and we only had one kid and I had no idea what I was doing. Anyway, it's <laughs> tiny. I have reorganized the like three square feet of extra space in there, like 50 times since we moved into this house. Anyway, so let's say we're working on trying to keep it so that we don't die when we try to walk through the laundry room to the garage. Then we, instead of like being mad, you just go through and go, hey, bud, your shoes and your backpack, can you put them in your cubby? And you just do it over and over and over. And eventually they start to do it themselves. And the key is to go, hey, you got your backpack in your cubby. Thanks for doing that, bud. I did see your shoes in the middle of the hall. Can you grab those? All right, awesome, thanks. And you just keep going. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like the bumpers on a bowling alley. Like we're just going to try to keep tapping you into the middle. And some of these skills you're going to learn on your own. And it's really fun as a parent, honestly, to get home from school and be like, oh, my God. Like, are they in the right spot? I don't know. But are all the backpacks and shoes like generally near the drop zone spot? Yes. <laughs> That's a Drop win. Zone. I love that. Is, is it between <clears throat> the door and their room trickled like craziness? It is not. So I'm pleased. So I think um, parents of tricky kids, parents who have, um, or people raising tricky kids who have kids who maybe have executive function issues. So I want to mm -hmm. read what executive function is. So executive function and self-regulation skills are the mental processes that enable us to plan, focus attention, remember instructions, and juggle multiple tasks successfully. I have two that cannot do these things. Like they flat out can't. My middle son, you know, they're, he's in fourth grade. They're doing things like reading the tiniest little paragraph on like what a mountain is. And then there's like four questions and you have to fill in the blank or whatever. And I watch him read the paragraph, read the question. Well, shit, all the information from the, the paragraph is gone. Now I'm reading the question. I'm going to try to hold the question in my head long enough to reference the paragraph, shit, the question's gone. <laughs> like he's just mm -hmm. trying to hold those pieces of information together long enough to answer a simple question of like, I don't know what makes a mountain. Um, and so <sighs> that's his whole day. His whole day is, you know, thinking of something to say, but maybe someone else is talking. So I'm like, hey, bud, hang on, let your brother finish. And constant frustration on his part because he won't remember by the time we get to him mm -hmm. what, you know, he's like, well, I will never remember. If I wait, I will never remember. Um, so we do a lot of like, you know, you need to have a notebook with you at all times. Yeah, does he do that? No. But he should have a notepad like on his desk at all times so that he can, he has no working memory. Write it mm -hmm. down because thoughts, thoughts come in and out just like a, a colander of information. Yeah. And 
And let me jump in here really quickly to say kids who have experienced trauma, the executive function is the first thing to go. And, and it results in behavior that I think, I think adults, if, if you're not careful, you think they're not listening or you think they're not paying attention. And I just use quote marks when I said that or a million other things that we make up. I mean, adults, parents, caregivers, we make so many assumptions about our kids' behavior that we we make an assumption, we give it meaning, we we have that, we build a whole story in our minds about what that means. And I've done this lots of times, that's why I'm saying it. And in reality, we often don't know why our kids are doing what they're doing. I think assuming good intent is something I always talk with my clients about when they're when they're working with their coworkers. And I wish I had learned that earlier with my kids <laughs> because yeah. I think if you assume good intent and stay calm, no, not always. Like I've had interactions with my daughters when I had to reach out to law enforcement to come in and, and to do an intake. I'm not saying always by any means, but I think staying calm, assuming good intent, and asking not too many questions because then they get defensive and they, you know, they feel like they're being grilled, but asking, Hey, what's, what's up? What's going on? Um, how can we do this better? My granddaughter and I, we have a joke about being team eyebrow. I don't know where that came from, but we both move our eyebrows a lot. So anyway, we're team eyebrow. And so I'll prompt her, Hey, are we being t- team eyebrow right now? Are we working together to get this done? Whatever we need to get done. Anyway, My point is that let's not make assumptions. Let's not make assumptions about our kids' motivation. And let's also not take things personally. I think if I had two things to offer, it would be that, well, I have more to offer. But I'm going to offer those two things. No, I think that's great. And I think, you know, it's interesting because I think my husband and I accidentally taught our middle son to lie to us because um I know where this is going I think a lot of us do that he was in trouble all the time so even when he wasn't doing something quote unquote wrong or against the rules if we said hey what are you doing like maybe he's in the garage he's got some chalk I would see the wheels turning he's making some shit up (laughs) and I'm like buddy I feel like you're making making up story when I think you're just using chalk on the driveway, which is fine. Mm-hmm. So I this was like a new thing in the last six months. We sat him down and I just said, hey, I feel like you're always like you're always on the lookout for getting in trouble. And so when we talk to you, you're always on the defense of mm-hmm. needing to have some gigantic explanation for why you're doing anything. Mm-hmm. And I really hate that for you because I feel like you're just kind of lying like now, like default, like your mm-hmm. default thing, because the truth might get you in trouble, whatever it is, like is you're lying. You're telling a story. I said, I feel like you're constantly trying to tell us what you think we want to hear. You're guessing because you know at any second you're, you could get in trouble. Because you guys, the things he does, okay, (laughs) just the things he does. (laughs) So we had a big talk and miraculously it has really helped Mm. And how we said to him, we can't help you. We can't have a conversation with you that starts in a place of untruth because then we just kind of are going down this hole of like, where are we? What's happening? And he has done way better about just saying, just saying things like, okay, so don't be mad, but, um, mm, I, t- yay. I, I, but I took a shower and I was all out of shampoo and body wash. So I used the hand soap and I used all of it. <laughs> oh, that's and I'm a win. like, that's a win. yeah. And I'm like, okay, you know what? You're clean. You smell great. Yeah. And, um, thanks for letting me know. I'll put yeah. it on the list. And you better believe that I only buy the 97 cent hand soap because that kind of thing (laughs) happens all of the time. As a matter of fact, I wrote in here, I have an invention idea and it's probably not a moneymaker, but I would like to take the detergent pod idea 
and turn it into a shampoo body wash pod where you send a child to the shower with just the one little dose that they need for that one event in the shower. Because if my kid has access to an entire bottle of body wash, mm -hmm. it's just not, it's gonna, it's less, it lasts a day. So we've tried all of the things. Wow. I've tried, I've tried bars of soap. Like I'm just mm -hmm. going to buy like a Brit, you know, gigantic thing of like the cheapest soap they have. But then the soap, it's the, it, it just, everything's an adventure for these people. So the soap can yeah. end up torn into tiny little pieces or it's left in a cup. So then it's just like this drippy, slimy mess. So really what they need is like a Tide Pod body wash situation where it's like, I'm going to go take oh. a shower and I hand them yeah. one. Do you remember bath beads? Do bath beads still exist? I kind of, yeah, like, but you would put those in like the bathtub, right? You put them in the bathtub, but they're, they, you know, they dissolve because the stuff that makes them a bead is, well, it dissolves in water. And so if any of you are listening, if, if I don't, if Lush, if Lush so, wants okay, to make so something. For the, yeah, for the longest mm -hmm. time, I would take the Lush Play-Doh soap stuff. Yes. And I would take a cutting board and a gigantic knife and I oh, would chop so it in mm -hmm. to like quarter size pieces and put it in a container. And mm -hmm. then when they were going to go take a shower, they could pick what color they wanted. And I'd give them, you know, a couple, like enough to have fun with, but not enough mm -hmm. to like use the whole thing. Okay. That's super smart. Yeah. I really, you know, sometimes I just come up with great ideas. We don't do that anymore. I think cause my youngest is eight and it's like, you know what guys, whatever happens in there. I don't know. I just, <laughs> cause you're like, just... look, I got the cheapest stuff I can find and I'm tired. Yeah, exactly. I, it's all uh, generic yeah. brand. You smell better. It's going to do damage to your skin forever, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, my middle kiddo, I bought really nice hair products. I bought the like natural oils um, because I wanted my kids to take care of their hair. Sure. And uh, yeah, she would do that. She would go through a $15 bottle of conditioner, hair conditioner in two days. It's so hard. And you know what I find myself mm. doing and I, I need to stop and I'm trying to stop is like assigning a dollar value to all mm. the shit they fuck up. Mm. So I'm constantly like, oh my God. That was $20 of hair wax. And you mm -hmm. just poked your toothbrush through it. And now it's all trash. Like I'm constantly, there was this show that never really took off called Everybody Hates Chris. And it took place in Brooklyn and it had Terry Crews on it. And his whole character thing was if somebody threw away even just like half of a rest of a sandwich. He'd be like, that's 37 cents of a sandwich. You threw away 37 <laughs> cents of a sandwich. Like the whole thing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I definitely, you know, when we first had children and I tried to be a stay at home mom and we had no money. Like I could, I was a stay at home mom that could not leave the house because we couldn't afford the gas to back out of the driveway. And I did the math on how much a diaper was and it was like 27 cents. And you mm -hmm. better believe if I just changed your diaper and you have a blowout two seconds later, I'm like, oh my God, that was 27 cents. Like this 27 <laughs> cents all day long. And I need, it isn't even about the money, but the money for some reason, I feel like is portraying to them. Like this wasn't nothing. I don't, yeah. I don't think they, I think until they get a whole lot older, they have no idea what you're saying no. now when you talk about money. And, and, and I no, also want to say it's hard to not think about things in this, in money uh, terms, because very few of us have enough of it. I mean, and raising kids is expensive and raising kids like ours is very expensive. Like, <laughs> I mean, short story. Um, last year I spent, oh gosh, 9,000 thousand ish dollars on uh, new front doors and new windows because my oldest uh, kicked my door in kicked my front door in and threw a statue through my window. Um, now she was older when she did that, but my kids have done that stuff for as long as they've been my kids. You know, I've had closet doors ripped off. Et cetera. And for those of you who have kids with reactive attachment disorder or oppositional defiance disorder, that's not even unusual. So I, I think it is difficult not to think about, Oh my gosh, how much is this going to cost me? And you know, 
my home insurance, um, I, I, I'm pretty close to having it uh, canceled because because of the situation that happened last year with the doors and the windows. So, so I, I don't want listeners to hear us and think that we're saying, oh gosh, just don't even worry about the money. Well, it's, no, and it's, it's hard because, you know, I mean, my husband and I work very hard to have nice things, to have a nice, pretty house. And we kind of really care how it looks. I mean, even my husband, like we're both into decor and making things look good together and, it's so hard when your kids like just don't care. I will say, so as far as picking your battles goes, there's a couple rules that they really follow because we don't make a big deal out of 100 things. We make a big deal out of like three things. So five years ago, we got a new couch, which everyone was like, don't get a new couch. Wait until they get, graduate and move out. I'm like, Okay, guys, our current couch is 15 years old. So you're telling me I should not replace it until for another 10 years. So I'm gonna have a 25 year old couch like that. I, I can't live this way. I need to update this piece of furniture that is falling apart. So anyway, we got a nice sectional and we just really talked to them about how the couch upstairs, you can do whatever you want with. You can flip it upside down. You can climb on it, whatever, because that was the old couch. The downstairs couch is for sitting. <laughs> That's all it's for. The down couch, mm -hmm. downstairs couch is for sitting. And somehow, they mostly just sit on it. Occasionally, they might get a wild hair and decide to vault over it or something. But for the most part, that is a rule they follow. And then, um, this is so silly, but Casey and I forever have had our eye on those like lamps that are just purely decorative that like are on a big stand and they swoop over your sofa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We love that kind of thing. And I was like, we cannot buy that. They will swing on it. Like this is not like, you know, whatever. So we bought the lamp and we all had a family meeting around the lamp. <laughs> and we were literally like, so the lamp is for lighting. <laughs> the lamp is not for swinging on. And they haven't, they have not broken it. I mean, they, and they break other things. And we have a lot of conversations. So um, I can post some pictures of this villagers. And you can think I'm crazy if you want. But our game room, which when we moved into this house and we had a three-year-old, and that's it, we thought was going to be a theater room. It is currently kind of like a ninja warrior situation. There's bean bags. There's a rock wall. There's monkey bars across the ceiling. There's trapezes and swings which it does sound very expensive to do, but honestly, I don't think all in over the five years, we've spent more than $300 on all of this stuff. And we did it like a little bit at a time. But I'm able to say, if you want to jump and wrestle, go upstairs. That mm -hmm. is what the upstairs is for. But the downstairs is for sitting. <laughs> and you can sit on the couch and watch TV and we'll eat maybe Cheerios or popcorn like on the furniture there. So they, those are the few rules that we make sure they follow. But then the rest of the time, yeah, if they want to slide down the stairs in a box, have at it, guys. Have a great time. If you want to flip the oh. furniture upstairs up, upside down and make a fort and get every sheet and blanket out, like that is their space. Mm -hmm. And so, wow, let me tell you, my blood boils when I walk in, walk in there and it's so trashed, but I'm just like, this isn't my space. This is their space. My space downstairs is sort of kind of nice looking. <laughs> so, but that's, we have to have those, we have to talk a lot about shared spaces versus space. Mm -hmm. So this bathroom is a shared space. So we need to respect each other, but your bedroom is your own space. So you know, let's respect our belongings and stuff, but also like, I'm not gonna lose my mind if it's a mess. Cause I don't have to hang out in here. So, yeah. And, you know. and I mean, I think that gets to something that you uh, put in the notes for this episode, which is giving them some control and giving them some wins. Yeah. And I, that's, I loved a, a book called love and logic, um, because it helped me a lot with that. And there are lots of good books out there. I think you use whatever works for your kids. I'm kind of a universe, universalist when it comes to advice of any kind. I just kind of pull what, what works for me and my kids. But giving them like what you've done, hey, 
here's a room that you can do whatever you want with, by the way, I'm that way with my kids' rooms. Like I, as long as you don't, well, I almost said as long as you don't damage anything, but that would be wrong. Um, you know, that, <laughs> that, that I would prefer it, you not damage this. Yeah. I would prefer that you not knock a hole in the wall. Um, but that if you do it, not just in their rooms, but in everything, if you can give them the perception of control, and that is really, really, the, that word perception is big. If you can give them the perception of control, then that allows them to have some more agency in their yeah. lives. And let's face it, kiddos don't have a lot of agency, right? And, and so you are making things easier on yourself and on them. When you do that, I have to tell a funny story. My, I was one of the few, I was a holdout parent on what, letting my son, because it never really popped up with my girls, but letting my son play incredibly violent video games. And I'm not going to say the names of video games because I don't even know if they're still around. Plus, I hate them. Um, so <laughs> I hate them too. <laughs> I hate them. They so haven't much. hit our house yet, but I'm oh, sure they're goodness. coming. So my son would go to sleepovers. We're talking about kids as long as as young as like fourth and fifth grade. And he would. The reason this popped up was he went to a sleepover and played. One of these games, and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the little baby violent games. I'm talking about the violent, violent, violent games that really only 21-year-olds should be playing, right? And so I had to have a discussion with his friend's mom because that was not cool. So flash forward to, I don't know how old he was, 13, 12, 12, 13, 14, someone, and I'm still not allowing them in my house. And so he came to me. I, I love my son. It's very hard to describe my son. He's, you, it's difficult to put him in a box, but he's very dry and he doesn't say a lot. He's an introvert. My son has been practicing for a pandemic his entire life. <laughs> I got and one so, of those. Yeah. I mean, just, he doesn't say a lot, but when he does, I, I'm like, oh, okay. I think I need to listen. So he came to me and said, um, mom, I really hate it that you don't trust me enough to let me play those games. And I went, but, but that has nothing to do with it. What are you talking about? And he said, well, I'm not an idiot. Like I can play that game and I know it's a game and I'm not going to go shoot people up. And I said, well, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with how much I trust you. It's, it's that I don't want that in my house. Like I don't want it in my house. I don't want you exposed to it. And he's like, but it's fun and I want to play it. And I did what I've done lots of times. And one of these days, if any of my kids are famous, they'll be telling this story <laughs> to the equivalent of Oprah. I um, said, all right, write me a paper. Uh, oh, write me yeah, a persuasive. Yeah. And I've done this since my kids could write. All right, write me a persuasive uh, paper on why you should be allowed to play one of these games. And my son handed my ass to me. He, <laughs> he shows you all he, the science, he, right? Oh, wow. He did. I, I still have it somewhere. I'll see if I can dig it out and, and share it. He handed my ass to me. He had his argument down pat. And I said, you know what? You just owned me. Yep. Okay. Let's download I it. I love and, that. And it's, uh, it's on. Yeah. And I mean, it's so funny. Okay. So I'm just going to tell one more story. So my son and I drove to Oklahoma city this week because he has some health things happening. He's going to have surgery and he's fine. Nobody get worried. He's fine. And again, he's an introvert. So I expected to be listening to, you know, uh, podcasts on the way down and podcasts on the way back and with him, with his earphones in listening to whatever, because he's not, he doesn't like to talk. He's not a real talker. So on the way down, we didn't talk a lot. But then on the way up, way back, he talked more than he probably has the entire 17 and a half years of his life. Well, now, was this post anesthesia? It was not post anesthesia. Oh, okay. Because sometimes was... people get real talkative. Well, yeah, no, he's hilarious on anesthesia. He had his wisdom teeth taken out and I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. And it was. Um, <laughs> no, I have to give a shout out to his school because I think and I have to say this quietly because he's at home and I don't want him to know that I, I don't want him to hear that I think this. Um, 
I think his school, I don't know what they're doing, but he is more expressive. He is more verbal. He is more relaxed. Um, I think the difference was we, so he's having jaw surgery. And I, I realized when we were at the pre-op appointment that he's nervous about what his face is going to look like afterwards. And I don't blame him. Like yeah. they're moving his jaw. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really, because he doesn't talk a lot. I mean, I didn't know that that was a thing. And so they were really, really good about explaining to him the process. I mean, really good explaining the process, what happens, how they, how a big part of what they're doing is making sure that his profile is all like good to go. Um, and so on the way back, I think he was just relieved. Oh, he'd been um, holding that all in. He'd been holding it in. Yeah. yeah. But on the way back, I don't remember what we were talking about, but he explained to me that he explained to me all kinds of things that I'm not going to share on the podcast, but he said, you know, mom, the way that you were with us, um, you made us learn how to think fast. And so this is a good and bad thing. And it's related to what your son who was lying to you, um, it's related to that. And I said, okay, what does that mean? Is that good or bad? Like, what are you telling me? And he said, well, you know, you always held us accountable. And when you said, okay, what the heck is going on? We had to think, and we had to very quickly like formulate what does mom want to hear right now? (laughs) I know. And that's the, (laughs) I know. And I said, is that good or bad? And he said, well, it could be either, but I think it's good because it helped me to understand how to communicate with people. Um, he actually said it helped me to, com- to learn how to communicate with older white people. <laughs> <laughs> he taught me a lot about old white people. Thanks. Old white people, specifically mom. Um, and then we started talking about code switching and, and how that's a thing. And, and um, it allowed him to code switch. I mean, which I'm glad about. I'm glad that it did because talking to old white people is a thing. It's a thing that allows you to hopefully have more opportunities um, in life and to make decisions about how you want to be perceived. Um, Well, in any environment. In any environment, exactly. And that's a whole episode that we probably need to interview someone about because I, I am certainly not an expert, but anyway, um, it did make me, it was really interesting and it did, um, I did think that I had possibly done some things well um, because he talked about how he knows how to write. He knows how to respond to people. He knows how to formulate arguments um, because I made him put those letters together, those papers. You know, it's one thing to be assigned a persuasive paper in class on like Mm -hmm. whatever opinion, but like he was really fighting for the right to be able to do that and convinced of himself. So Mm -hmm. I love that. Something I saw, I don't know, on one of the parenting things that I follow on Instagram probably recently was instead of going to your kid and saying, hey, you need to do your homework. You've been home for however long you do your homework or you haven't done your chores. You need to do your chores. It was, hey, do you have any homework to do? And if you do, what's your plan for that? Mm-hmm. Yes, Oh, bravo, my bravo. God. Mm-hmm. What's your plan for that? Yeah. I say that like five million times a day now. I mm-hmm. love it. I literally mm-hmm. will be like, um, hey, um, you know, your bathroom is a pit and, you know, that's not okay. So what's your plan? And they kind of look at me and they're like, I guess I'll pick it up here in a minute. I'm like, okay, great. Or I'll do it. Right. Yeah. Instead of you interrupting what they're doing, Mm -hmm. again, it goes back to them having some control. Yeah. So if their plan is I'm going to finish eating this mac and cheese and then I'm going to go take the trash out. Cool. Then everybody's happy. Yeah, exactly. I learned to stop doing the do it because I told you so stuff quite a while ago. I never actually said that. I never said do it because I told you so, but I would say, darn it, take out the trash. I told you to take out the trash. You haven't taken out the trash. Why haven't you taken out the trash? It's so upsetting because I do everything I can to support this family. You know, I mean like big drama queen ridiculousness. 
Like yes. I do all of this stuff, and yeah. you can't just take and you a bag can't even ten take feet. Out the damn and then trash. my kid will be like, "It's got to be more like twenty feet." And I'm like, "Oh my god, I just want to kill you." <laughs> and then you have this just big showdown, right? Mm-hmm. And and showdowns are bad, people. Yeah. Showdowns are bad. Like when you, it's sort of like the Cold War. Like when you escalate and escalate and escalate and escalate, uh, no one is winning. No one is winning. Well, and and so, also, these kids are so, so smart. So it's yeah, not like yeah, yeah, I, yeah. they can run circles around me. I mean, <laughs> well, and let's face it, we're tired. We have things, uh, we, our mm-hmm. minds are on other things. But if you can, if you can say, hey, um, the trash needs to go out sometime this afternoon. Can do you think you can work that in? Which is the mm-hmm. equivalent of what's your plan? What's your plan I, for that? I, I usually say, do you think you could work that into your day? And that that is so much better. Speaking of, let's talk about um, let's let's talk about ramping things up because I see this on a lot of I see this on a lot of foster adopt reactive attachment disorder discussions where people just ramp up and ramp up kind of like what you were talking about when a kid, when a kid is in trouble all the time. I have, I have at various times, <laughs> this is terrible. I have at different times removed everything from my child's room, everything. Mm. Yeah. So we're talking toys, bed, furniture. Um, and that probably sounds really cruel to some of you. I will also say it was advice I was given by mental health professionals. But the um, thing is, is there was an episode of the Cosby show where they did that. Oh, seriously? So, I don't remember that yes, at all. Theo's character, Malcolm mm-hmm. Jamal Warner's character, uh, he was, I think the plot was more like him acting like he could move out any day now and didn't mm-hmm. need his parents. So they took everything and made him work to earn, like, monet- like they were trying to teach him a financial lesson. Yeah. But my ta- I think my parents' takeaway was, what a good idea, because they sure tried that. Oh, and, really? Wow. Oh, yeah. And let me tell you, the person in my family that did it to ended up thinking it was really cool and bringing their friends over and going, look, I have to sleep on the floor. I have oh, nothing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is this crazy. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing. And you're that's sitting so- there going, I went nuclear and you're not mm-hmm. like, you and don't. I'm not getting, that's the thing. You can't assume that the motivation of a 30, 40, 50 something is the motivation of a child. So mm-hmm. like, first off, there's a, there's no way for a kid to come back from that. When you mm-hmm. make, when you make the, the hoops so, um, so big and and you make the stakes so high these are kids these are kids who to your point stephanie their little brains have not developed to the point of tiny adults they just haven't and, and so you have to make it feasible for them you have to give them some exit strategy like they because have then to they're be able, like let it all burn yeah, they're like let fuck it, it i'm going to i'm going to burn the house down which by the way i did have a kid light my house on fire and that was fun because I was on the turnpike. Accidental or intentional? I mean, is there really a difference? Um, well, I mean, I don't know. I knocked a candle over isn't the same as I mm, lit the curtains on uh, fire. Uh, lit, lit, <laughs> okay. T- I'm like, splitting yeah. hairs, yeah, apparently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but seriously, but seriously, if you're an eight, nine, 10 year old kid, you're already struggling. You already don't quite fit in the world or the world doesn't fit you. And then the parents who are your only safe place, right? Possibly, Mm -hmm. hopefully are your safe place are like, you suck so much that we're going to take everything out of the room until you figure out how to be better. Right. And you just need to figure it out. Uh, eight year old. Just figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah. Because you, you suck so much and we're so frustrated with you and we, we don't have anything left in our toolbox. So we're just going to take all your shit away. Um, that that is not like and put yourself in the in the shoes of the child. That is not going to be effective. It is not. And I am someone who took has taken doors off. Like if you need anyone to remove a door from its hinges, I can tell you how to do that because I've done it more than once. Um, because if you slam your door over and over again in my house, I'm just going to take it off the hinges. Thankfully, that has not happened in years, and I don't recommend it. But 
Um, and I saw a TikTok on that the other day. I was like, I wanted to like call the person up and go, oh, don't do that. It's bad. It's hard to come we back did, from that. Yeah, we did very recently threaten to take a door off its hinges because it was getting slammed so much that the frame around the door was splintering. Mm. <sighs> um, so with that child and their bedroom is on the main floor, just around the corner from the living room. Mm -hmm. Um, and he likes his room dark. So I said, tonight we're gonna do bedtime and leave your door open and see how you like it because. Oh, that's a good like interim step. Yeah. And he hated it because he could hear us. He could, you know, the dogs little click, click, click on the floor, mm -hmm. the TV and oh, he I'm came out, you know. And he came and out and was like, okay, I, I get it. I, I, I give. Will. Got it. And I'm like, you can literally, I mean, I like go in your room and be mad. Throw every pillow, every blanket, every stuffed animal, every everything. But you're breaking, like, look at what you're doing to the, the nails are coming out of the door frame. Like, I, yeah. you, we can't be doing that. And this is not the first door that has been here. This is oh. the third door that has been Ooh, here. Ooh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Not with that. this kid. Like, my kids, mm -hmm. listen, as with all things in our household, there's a constant rejiggering, like, strategy at our house. So he is not the one that messed the door up before. Mm. The kids kind of kept, there was like a little bit of a musical chairs of bedrooms and Literally, I'm constantly like, okay, what if this kid slept in this room? Would that make everything better? Anyway, so he wasn't the one who had broken the door. And so he wasn't the kid who'd broken the door. When he moved into the room, mm -hmm. he was like, do I have to have a broken door? I didn't break the door. Right. So we replaced it. Mm, as in, a, got it. And then yeah. he proceeded to break the door. And I was like, mm-mm, mm-mm. Yeah. Speaking of, that reminds me. So one of the things that we did, because at one point it was like, you keep sneaking in your brother's rooms and breaking his Legos mm -hmm. and like you need to replace his Lego set. So now the rule is, first of all, <laughs> recently Casey went online and he bought these really affordable safes and every single member of our family has a small like shoebox sized safe in their room. Mm -hmm. So if you have cash that you don't want stolen or very precious Pokemon cards, mm -hmm. or you made a Lego set that you just, it's so special to you, you don't want anyone to touch it, it's gotta go in the safe. <laughs> it's just gotta go in the safe. Like came home from my mom's house recently with a gigantic thing of cherry lifesavers and those have lived in the safe ever since. <laughs> <laughs> no one is taking his cherry lifesavers, okay? So, but it enables us to be like, well, buddy, if that was really precious to you and you didn't want anybody to touch it, it should have been in your safe. Mm -hmm. And then um, it also like, oh my God, it gives them some place that's just theirs. But we talk mm -hmm. a lot about like, I know you spent all morning watching TV in the game room and you put together something really cool with Legos, but then you left it there and you went and you went swimming for three hours and someone else came in and they kept on building and took it apart. But you left it in the game room and the game room is for everyone. It's a shared space. All the toys in there are shared. If you made something really spectacular and you want to keep it forever, you need to put it in your room at a bare mm -hmm. minimum. Put it in your room, put it on a shelf, and that's your special place. Because my oldest two, they share a shower and for the longest time, I don't think they do this anymore – they would take Legos into the shower and they would just mm. sit on the floor in the shower and build stuff. So one would With build some water running. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Listen, the water bill is not a battle I'm interested in fighting and our water heater exploded a year ago and now we have a tankless water heater. So it's just like, whatever guys, just huh. whatever so you're doing. Interesting. In there. I like, Wa I really hmm. water. Um, for my middle, especially is a thing. Hmm. Like I, we were highly motivated, honestly, to put in a pool because of him. Like hmm. if he's anxious or upset or dysregulated water. So if he wants to go take a shower and be in there for half an hour, I just don't care. And I think we, can... we call that a coping mechanism. It is. And it's calming. So yes, they would go in the shower, build something out of Legos and of course, leave it in the shower because they were shower Legos. And then the next person would take a shower. They'd rearrange them. And then they would try to kill each other because I made the coolest car in the shower. And then he – and I'm like, you know what? If you made the coolest car in the shower, you need to dry it off, take it to your room. Right. Like you can't. Yeah. Shower Legos are communal. 
<laughs> Did you think 20 years ago that parenting would include saying shower Legos are communal? I mean, I no, no that was not on my bingo card. Mm-mm. I didn't also think I would need to say, hey, the stool you stand on to wash your hands is not also free to stand on and try to pee into the toilet from. That's not what it's for. <laughs> You're not going to make it. I need you to stand on the floor. I think that's just, that's a boy thing. It is. They're so uh, disgusting. Yeah, they are. I have to say, I couldn't figure out why our side yard smelled like the back alley of a bar. And it's because it was the back alley of a bar because my son, we have three bathrooms, but that wasn't enough. If you're outside... You don't have time oh, no, to go no. outside. He would take the time to go outside. Oh. He would be indoors and then go, you know, I feel like I need to relieve myself. So I think I'll step outside and <laughs> um, urinate against the fence hmm. uh, because then the, the wood just like soaks all that could up. Could it be like artistic, like it make a little be. drawing? It, I mean, it could be. We'll go with that. You know, he was probably spelling his name on the fence or something. And um, and I, you know, I I adopted as a single person. I, there's no grown man in the house to go. Because grown men immediately are like, yeah, your son is peeing outside. Like, they, they pick up on that stuff way faster. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, what is happening? Do we have a raccoon? <laughs> like, what is happening? Is there a raccoon out here writing his name on the fence? Exactly. Like, is there a really unhealthy, like with bladder issue raccoon? Um, I couldn't figure it out. And so finally one of the girls was like, uh, mom, uh, my son uh, was uh, stepping outside to urinate pretty often. So that's probably like every male's Uh, dream, frankly. Yeah. I mean, and we've gotten so far away from discipline, but that is pretty darn funny. I well, want to say that's a pick your battle thing. That's a, pick well, your, I mean, seriously you know, is, yeah. and that I mean, might be worth picking the battle and like pee inside, please. Well, or yeah, it was like, hose hey, the fence off once a week. I don't I know. Don't, well, in the middle. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, I don't want to smell your urine. Um, and I don't want our neighbors to smell your urine. So I'm going to need you. You know what I did? I think I asked him to step like further back in the yard. And actually use the flower bed instead of the fence. I mean, we found a solution because God mm-hmm. knows it, urinating indoors was not on the table. Um, okay. <laughs> you so know what, though? The amount of, like, we're going to have to dig all of our tile up when my, our kids move out. I mean, the grout situation from the oh. amount of urine is Ooh. just, it's, yeah. I mean, we scrub Real, and scrub and scrub. Since we're talking about urine, I remember my mom... <laughs> Uh, Let's talk more about it. What else you got? Way off the discipline. Um, my mother, who was a lovely woman, who is no longer with us, um, she was. So she had two girls and a boy, just like I do. My my brother was her youngest, and she was trying to figure out where the urine smell was coming from in our you know 1970s home. And eventually, oh my God, I have a guess. Okay, but keep going. She she eventually figured out it was in two places. One in the air conditioning vent. Yes, yep, the vents, because they were in the floor, right? Right next to the toilet, exactly. Mm -hmm. And two on the ceiling, because, (gasps) yes, because Uh. someone with a very like strong spray, one of my brother's friends, (laughs) One of my brother's friends had shot the popcorn ceiling with his urine. Do you know how much respect that kid got out of that? Like, they, oh my God. But my mom told that story, pretty sure until she died. Because, because like us, she's like, where's the small calling coming from? And mm-hmm. her house yeah. was way cleaner than mine, like way cleaner. And she's like, where's the smell coming? I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. And it, and it was in the HVAC vent in the floor. It was, well, and uh, it's, yeah. it's so important while we are raising these people in our house <laughs> to remember that I think it's time plus distance or something equals humor. I can't remember. There's a saying. Um, I don't know what that is. And, well, it's it's basically like how much time and distance from the event have oh. you had mm-hmm. before it's funny, right? Because mm-hmm. I guarantee you, 
in the moment that I find out someone has been peeing on the ceiling of my house, <laughs> I will not think it's funny <laughs> yeah. for a while. Yeah. But then sure later, I never thought it was. Yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, but it is. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, literally, mm -hmm. I mean, I briefly mentioned the pink hairspray thing a couple episodes mm -hmm. episodes ago, but it is a great story. It, but that kind um, of thing happens in our house on the regular, and that's uh, where it gets exhausting. Well, yeah. So let's talk about, um, because we probably need to hit some points home. I think that, I mentioned Love and Logic. Are there any books mm -hmm. that you especially like or any philosophies that you especially like? Well, I really like Love and Logic. I actually follow the ADHD magazine Attitude, and it's ADD Attitude on um, Facebook. Not all articles there are created equally because they're definitely like kind of an aggregate for stuff, but there's lots of good articles on there. Um, and then the explosive child I feel like was really helpful for me because it helped me understand that mostly my kid didn't have the ability to commu communicate, that he had expectations. He yeah. couldn't explain what they were. He is frustrated off the charts and we didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, we're just of the, the mind that if there's going to be a consequence, it needs to be logical mm -hmm. to exactly the mistake they have made. If, if there is one, well, like, yeah. you know, I mean, you exactly, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about what happens when, excuse me, when other adults are upset with your kids, because this, this one was a hard for me was, was hard for me. It's a little bit hard for me. I always felt very reactive whenever, I mean, I had kids who were, bullied, both bullied and they were the bullies, right? And sometimes in the same situation. And I, there's enough people pleaser in me um, that I felt really reactive and as though I needed to fix those issues. Sure. Yeah. Um, and had to really, really work to go, okay, what is really happening here? There's a really funny story that is related to your, just take stuff away. Like, don't make it, um, don't tempt kids, uh, make the environment easier for them if possible. So when my middle kid was in grade school, or not grade school, seventh and eighth grade, whatever it was called then, middle school, junior high, whatever, one of her teachers wrote me the angriest condescending email and I, let me tell you how much I enjoy condescension. It is super effective with me, especially if you've never met me. And it was about, and I'm sorry, I'm going to start laughing. And she was upset because my middle kiddo kept putting her fingers in the Scentsy Wax. <laughs> what? What is Scentsy Wax? Oh, oh my gosh, seriously. Is it like a um, sensory tool or is no. Oh, Scentsy. Scentsy. Oh, Scentsy. Like she had the candle like she thing. Had the little, okay, okay. Yeah, she had the Got and it. I okay, oh, and right. I don't I've never owned Scentsy. I never bought it. Me neither, I, but I know I mean, what it I think is. Okay. you put it in a in a like a light it warms like a thing. It. Yeah, and it's you a flameless it. right. flameless candle it's situation. It's a flameless candle that comes yes. in I'm sure a cornucopia of mm -hmm. scents that are very yes. pleasing and you know god bless teachers because i could not do their jobs ever however if you are teaching seventh and eighth graders and you're going to be upset when they put your finger put their fingers in your scentsy wax then maybe put the scentsy wax somewhere where they cannot put their fingers in it because i'm 53 years old and i would have a hard time not putting my fingers in warm wax um and so I need to find that email. I need to find that email and remove all details from it. Well, and I just would want to be like, hilarious. Hey, let's, mm -hmm. let's make a deal. I'm mm -hmm. what's your favorite Sensi scent. Okay. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to replace that for you. But also, <laughs> can you plug that in and put it on the top shelf so right, that so this, no kid exactly. will walk by and stick their well, finger in it? And that's what I, I mean, my email to her was, thank you, Ms. So-and-so for, to, communicating blah 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 here's my cell number I'm always happy to talk with you and also I think it would be a win for everyone if you could put it not on your desk 
where they have to walk by to submit their work um, and where it's not tempting them because it wasn't just her. I mean, I asked her, I'm like, is anyone else putting their fingers in the Scentsy Wax? She's um, like, yes, sure everyone enough, is. It is so infuriating. Exactly. And I'm What so can frustrated. we do about this besides the obvious? <laughs> I know. What possible solution could there be to this tragedy? Has um, she heard of plugins? Like, there's got to be another option. Well, you know, and as a, like, and as a reminder, like at this time, I'm also dealing with like inpatient psychiatric care for at least one kid. Um, at least one kid is getting picked up by the cops regularly. I mean, I, I, I wanted know. to go, lady. Like, I wish that was my biggest problem. People, well, and I'm sure it's very fresh. I'm sure that's very frustrating yeah, because everything you know, is relative. You're Everything's paying for the relative. thing. So I did want to mention something, and I want to again say, I know we are incredibly privileged that my kids go to this private school, all right? This is new for us, so I'm constantly amazed at what they do. But my son and this other little boy got into it um, during a round of Gaga Ball. Are we familiar with Gaga Ball? I think my sister taught that, but she taught at a private school. Okay, right, sure. (laughs) It was just a, you know what? Actually, there's a church down the road that has one of these like in their yard. Okay. It's just like a octagonal wooden pin Mm -hmm. and that you kind of kick the ball. And I guess if it hits you from the knees down, it's like dodgeball kind of from the knees down, you're out. You know what it is? It is, it is a, a softer, gentler form of dodgeball because apparently we can't do dodgeball anymore because it's not the eighties. Oh, my kids do dodgeball. Mm -mm. Mm. Yeah. And do um, they do it in a formal environment or do they do it? Yeah, like even at their public school, they did dodgeball. Mm-hmm. But I mean, maybe they okay. were using like little foam wiffle balls. I don't know. They did. I don't know. But in a dodgeball say, tournament. All right. I'm sorry. I'm just going to need to say this. I was excellent at dodgeball. Like, oh I my God, loved me it. too. Mm-hmm. I loved it when someone would throw the ball at me and I would catch it. And you're like, and I, yes, yeah, screw you, exactly. Nathan. <laughs> yeah, you thought you were gonna get a girl in the face, but guess what? Um, I gotcha. Yeah, you're out. So that's, I'm sure that tells everyone listening what yeah. kind of freak shows we well, are. You better look out for Red Rover because I will clothesline you. <laughs> you are going down. Your airway is gonna get crushed by my forearm. Can and we no. Start about- no one plays that game anymore because it's know, very dangerous. Because it's you could send someone to the ER. Yeah, well, that the game. kids like clothesline, feet in the air, flat on their back, like so many reasons. Oh, kids today will never I know love the fun. That game. God, oh, it's so, so violent. That you and I both enjoyed violent. Red games. Rover, it's Red terrible. Rover. Send Shelly right over to get clotheslined right yep. here. So some okay. people are Googling right now. Oh, oh if you don't know what Red, Red, Red Rover is, we will talk about it more later. Okay, so Gaga Ball. So my son is um big sense of justice, big sense of rule following. Most of his conflicts are over like you're out. And you're lying and saying you weren't out. And like (laughs) the whole group out here is up in arms and I'm going to enforce the rules. Okay. So this kid was out. Everyone agreed he was out. He didn't want to be out. So my son is like not having it. So they have it out on the playground. The school spent time researching what happened. Then they sat down with the school counselor and had a little meeting on how these two could get along and how to show respect to each other and how to deal with each other in the future so that this doesn't happen again. Instead of like, you both have lunch detention for a month and like, you're not learning anything. So they like worked on a plan together for if they're mad at each other again, what to do, go get a teacher, you know, Mm -hmm. think through your action, whatever. And then they sent the document to us and each of the kids signed it. (laughs) I just thought it was it was so different than anything I've ever experienced, which would have been like, here's your punitive punishment Mm -hmm. and no one's learning anything. I just thought it was really interesting and different way of handling it. It is interesting. And I think that, I think it's also really labor intensive. And so. Oh, sure. Not just anyone has time to do that. Yeah. That's absolutely true. But what I like about it is, um, what's, and so I, you know, I like that solution a lot better at the same time. I don't know how 
many schools could pull that off, not with the number of kids yeah. that they have to manage. Um, you know, for a time, we had a startup program in Tulsa Public Schools that was restorative justice oriented. They didn't call it restorative justice. It was kind of under the radar. It was having counselors in select schools where if kiddos were having a rough day, like they were acting out, you know, they would be pulled into this specific counselor's office who is trained in restorative justice. And, and they would basically, and I'm, I'm generalizing this a lot. They would say, Hey buddy, what's up? Are you having a tough day? And then that kid would have the opportunity to say, Hey, my parents are getting divorced or my grandpa died or somebody said I was ugly or whatever. And they would deal with it that way instead of, Hey, you're misbehaving. You're a bad kid. And now we're going to give you some punitive something. Right. Cause right. that doesn't help. It doesn't help. Well, to, and I know, think, yeah, I think the thing is, is I realize it's time intensive. What, this school counselor did. Mm -hmm. However, if they didn't intervene the way they did, I bet the two of them would continue to get in trouble and get in encounters with each other. And so it's mm -hmm. kind of like the whole, okay, do we, do we spend 30 minutes mm -hmm. like during the kids yeah. lunch hour doing this? And honestly, it was probably a 10 minute process. You can't get my kid to talk about anything for more than three minutes, mm -hmm. you know, and then she typed it up. But now they have ground rules and every mm -hmm. all the teachers have a copy of it and they all know what to do. Otherwise, these two are just going to keep going at it because it's not like yeah. they, you know, would suddenly well, see eye to eye. There's like uh, getting ahead of the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you put time in up front so that you to, – to reduce the kind of time and, and impact on the back end. I yeah. get that. And, and let me say, like my – the grade school that my granddaughter goes to is the same grade school that my kids went to. And they do an excellent job. Like they do – an and, and um, it's a growing public school. They do an excellent job. I'm sure that they could pull off what you're describing. Um, but, but I think not all public schools have the same resources. Anyway, I think my point is that – punitive measures, whether they come from teachers or parents or whatever, they're not effective. They're not effective. It's kind of the way that I was raised. Although to be fair, I got in trouble like maybe two times my entire life. Um, it's, it's the way I was raised. I think it was the way a lot of us were raised. And so it is hard not to duplicate what your parents did or duplicate what your grandparents did. And so you, you do have to think about like, what can I do instead? And, mm -hmm. and hopefully there, hopefully we've mentioned a few things, or at least we've said, Hey, I did this. Don't do it yourself mm -hmm. because it didn't work. Um, but I mean, I would love to hear from whoever's listening, what works for them. Like there's a lot of stuff out there. I'd love to know what works, what hasn't worked, what suggestions do you have, et cetera. Well, yeah. And I think like we've talked about before, every kid is different. And, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day, you know, my brothers and I did not have the same experience with my parents. I mean, like, it's like they were raised by different people. My mm -hmm. brother, my oldest brother is six years older than me. So by the time they got to me, I think they were a little tired and um, had six more years of parenting experience. So there's that difference along with all the personality differences. But, you know, I have one kid that I can just be like, can we talk? And then mm -hmm. we talk. And then like we've kind of set ourselves back on track and then, you know, the other two I have to get way more, um, way more creative with for sure. Directive. You have to get more mm. directive. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure my theory is that my youngest, because he's got like the whole world, including his brothers kind of coming at him all the time, like really no matter what we say or do to him matters. He's like, meh, <laughs> like he just... He doesn't care. He's like, you know what? Nobody else has been that good with me today. So you're unhappy too. Whatever. Like, it's, you just look at him like, are you a serial killer? What are you doing? Because he is literally like, I'm like, in your head, you're like, cry. Like, care. And he's like, eh. shrug. Okay. Yeah, but whatever. I think I think kids are also wired a certain way. You know, I mean, the whole nurture versus nature thing is definitely, it's definitely a thing, but kiddos, kiddos are wired a certain way. It, yeah. I mean, well, in all seriousness and just, I mean, just take a break I, and we've mm -hmm. meandered 
all over the place today. Clearly, we, we need a better outline. But we, we did mean, great. We did the whole outline and more. So, villagers, we'd love to hear um, any tips and tricks that have worked for you because clearly Shelly and I are still figuring it out. And I hope I get some of this together before. I've got 10 years before they're all even out of the house and I'm still learning. So, if you'd like to join our members only Facebook group, we'd love to have you so that you can comment and talk about your lives without worrying that, you know, I don't know, your next door neighbor is going to see what you're going through because sometimes there's a lot of judgment out there. So we do have that Facebook group going and um, we'd love to hear from you between now and our next episode. So um, please reach out if you have any thoughts. Uh, and let me also say we are, uh, when we started recording today, we were 15 downloads, like one, five, 15 downloads away from 500 Woo-hoo! downloads for our first three episodes and our promo. We think that's pretty good. And, and so yes. we think that we have hit on topic that people want to hear about, but we want to continue being relevant. So let us know what you like hearing about. Let us know what you'd like to hear about less. Um, let, let us know, I mean, do you want, do you want to share your story? Do you want to be a guest? Whatever. Uh, we would love to hear that from you because the whole reason we're doing this is for the people who are listening right now. Absolutely. Feel less alone. I've, that definitely makes me feel less like a crazy person whenever you and I talk, Shelly, because we're mm-hmm. both going through some craziness. We're on our own little islands. We're trying to build that community. And I would just like to say good on me that I have made it an hour and 40 minutes uh, with COVID brain. So (laughs) we're going to stop talking. All right. So I can go lay down. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like and subscribe to our podcast and maybe even take a couple extra seconds to write a review so others can find us and join our village. We really want to hear what challenges you're facing and maybe even feature your comments and questions on the show. So if you'd like to contribute to our village, please leave us a voicemail at 918-409-0562. That's 918-409-0562. Or send us an email at wherethefismyvillage at gmail.com. Thanks, and we'll see you right here next week.